welcome all of you for this month's webinar as we are getting to wrap up 2018 this is the topic we picked for this uh, month is uh, managing required requirements <clears throat> across distributed teams so many of you who've been in and around software industry are probably quite familiar with the challenge of uh, building the right thing in software that in our 14 years of synergistic experience and of course going beyond in my case to 20 25 years building the right thing in software is a chronic challenge with software teams and it makes gets even harder when you have a distributed team meaning you have a dev team in one time zone in a different geography and a product management and a business team in a different time zone perhaps in a different geography this makes it this problem significantly harder and we deal with this at synergip as a software development services company uh, we deal with this challenge all the time so what we're doing today is uh, bringing our experience of last 14 years or so to give you a bit of a guidance from our perspective of how to manage software requirements across distributed teams while you're following good agile practices and all that and to share that perspective we have our senior product manager ranjini shah um, uh, to wayne she lives and breathes this challenge day in day out so welcome ranjini and tell us how you see this problem and how can we better manage requirements across distributed teams all right thank you himan Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Ranjini, and uh, I wanted to uh, give you all uh, a, a perspective that hopefully helps uh, everyone here uh, understand this a little bit better, and at least uh, give our listeners an experience on how we manage this challenge, which is uh, basically. a communication problem uh, according to mike cone he um, i have attended i follow his agile methodology um, have been to his classes many times so um, uh, as i mentioned here software requirements is a communication problem and it, it is uh, it's a communication issue because we are really uh, we what we are trying to achieve is a shared understanding of uh what software product needs to be built so so we need to build a bridge between the people who want uh, uh a product built and those actually building them and particularly how do we do this effectively when the when the product manager and owner perhaps and the development teams are in two on opposite ends of the world and have limited time to interact and um another uh, challenge is uh, we particularly face that we hear from our clients is what level of detail do you need for your teams to be successful so um those are the questions uh, that we hope to address with this webinar and um and the other um and, and the outcome that we wish to achieve to, during this process is not only a shared understanding and also setting uh, expectations for both the client teams which tend to be here in the US and the development teams they may be remote whether they are in india or eastern europe somewhere else so uh, that's that's the outcome that we are looking for yeah, let me just interject ranjini one thing and i forgot i should have reminded so all the audience you're welcome to ask questions along the way and i hemant as a moderator will keep track of questions on my q and a panel and inject those questions as they need to be answered as ranjini is covering uh, this material but we'll still leave about 10 or 15 minutes towards the end to take more broader questions on this material so okay all right so um one of the things that i want to start with is an analogy which hopefully will help uh uh drive home the point a little more and about when you ask for a pizza what gets goes into the making of a pizza that you want uh uh is you want to mention if you just say i want a pizza you could you may just end up getting a very plain cheese pizza versus uh the uh the lots of veggies and other toppings which look much which looks much better at least to me on the right hand side so you know what when you go and ask for a pizza the 
uh, you do specify a large, small, medium, what type of crust, what kind of sauce, and what are the different toppings. So if you can imagine a product to be, uh, you know, a, a, if, as if you're ordering a pizza, and as you can probably guess that the more detail you provide, the your the chances are better that you're going to get the pizza that you're looking for. So I just wanted to throw that analogy so that uh, it's it's something to remember by. So so in in our world in Synerzip and in my experience for, in, for the last five years being a product proxy product manager for our clients. Um, and other product managers in uh, Synerzip, we found two factors to be uh, big in the um, in in this in understanding requirements uh, for a remote team or a distributed team. On the x-axis, we have the gra available granularity of requirements, basically details. And on the y-axis, vertical axis, is the domain familiarity. So, um, so that to go into the details of available granularity of requirements, on the low uh, details, uh, on the lower end of the spectrum, sometimes we work with clients who can only provide the vision. They just have a vision of, oh, I, I want an app, that uh, an e-commerce app. And that is that is all we get, and and there are on the other high end of the spectrum we have detailed user stories with acceptance criteria. So and then you know there is the, and that's why there is a spectrum. Uh, we've broken it down into high, medium, and low just for um, to kind of quantify it or uh, give a zone of you know uh, error. Etc. And also on the domain familiarity side, uh, the higher uh, the familiarity with the domain is, you are um, uh, the, the the product turning out as expected. The chances are higher. So they, these are two big factors. So Ranji, when you say domain familiarity, you're referring to the development team's familiarity with the demo domain. Correct. The remote team or the remote team, team, team development team, basically yeah. QA developers. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so yeah, and the available requirements is typically on the product uh, manager, product, uh, yeah, product management or business side of things. So, um, so we have uh, two ends of the spectrum on uh, on both uh, for both factors. And as you can see, when, when you have a, a familiarity of the development team, let's say, uh, and I'll go into the example in the next slide, when they're familiar and there's uh, well-written requirements or you know, user stories, uh, good description and acceptance criteria, we, uh, you, you know, we are in the green zone of the product being built to uh, requirements or specifications. And as we get into uh, low, uh, where there's in a situation where only the vision is available, and the development team is not quite familiar with the domain, then um, it, uh, we go into the orange or red zone uh, where the risk of a product not uh, being built to specs or requirements is much higher. So I will move on to the next slide where. Um, We'll get into some examples to illustrate the point. So um, when I say uh, on the requirements granularity um, axis, we, we can have epics and we have user stories. We have user stories with clear acceptance criteria. And for uh, and the domain, uh, on the domain axis familiarity, we have mobile email client. We have possibly an online auction platform, and uh, on the low end of the familiarity is a pharmacy system. And I'll um, go into details of uh, the domains a little more. So one of the clients I worked with wanted a mobile email client uh, built because they already had a, a server 
uh, which was an open source uh, email platform, and they had a web client, and they came to us with uh, the uh, requirement of build us a mobile email client. And uh, we really had actually not, uh, that was it, the, the only, that was the only vision that they had. We did not have epics or any stories. But the development team was able to execute really well on it because everyone, uh, pretty much around the world, most developers is, are familiar with a mobile email client. We use it on, on a daily basis. Your point is <clears throat> something like a mobile email client domain is so well understood by most developers, regardless of where they are, India or South America or Eastern Europe, Europe or, or Salt Lake City, Utah, they can take this high level requirement or vision and still d build something that, uh, and come close to what was intended. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So something as uh, something that a development developer is very familiar with. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the medium uh, end of the, at the medium uh, portion of the spectrum, we have something like an eBay. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, most developers, anybody tech fab, uh, in the technology field mm -hmm. is mostly familiar. Mm -hmm. But there is there is a chance that. Uh, depending on what the client wants, it may be slightly different. They, uh, so again, it's it's somewhat familiar mm -hmm. because more you know um, there's Flipkart in, in uh, well not Flipkart but uh, that's an e-commerce platform. But there's <clears throat> enough familiarity with eBay type of uh, applications. But uh, it, it depending on the variations we could have. Um, See, so the point about eBay, I guess, what you're yeah. making is <clears throat> eBay is a global app uh, application just like Facebook is and Netflix is these days and, and Uber is. Everybody in the world uses them, so they become familiar with these global apps and therefore it is not as hard for them to relate to that business domain. Right, right. That makes so, sense. So, but the, the, depending on what the, uh, the business wants, it could be different. So <laughs> we just have to um, account for it. And then at the uh, lower end of the familiarity spectrum is the pharmacy system. And we do, uh, Sirzip has a client and we do this work for them. Um, so one of the challenges for the development team, uh, remote development team is, is that a pharmacy, US pharmacy system, there is the, the developer sitting across, uh, in, in halfway across the world does not experience this. Yeah, so, so U.S. pharmacy system unique. is completely different than a pharmacy system in India. Correct. Industry in India, yeah. Right. Any healthcare-related uh, item. So uh, there's another client that I work with was uh, healthcare insurance, uh, health insurance system. So a pharmacy system is completely, uh, it's not something you, the team can visualize unless they experience it. So... Um, so in this situation where uh, even with user stories with clear acceptance criteria, uh, it, it, the team would, uh, you know, can execute, but uh, they would have a harder time mm -hmm. to understand the business problem initially. Yeah, let's take one question that just came in. <clears throat> Someone is asking about the notion of cone of uncertainty how it applies in agile development and I'll just answer that uh, directly in this case. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> the cone of uncertainty as, as I understand applies more in the over the cycle of agile development as you as people and the teams get further clarity on the requirements intent and estimate that goes with it and all that. I think what we're talking here is a, sli a slightly different challenge which is how familiar is the development team with the domain itself so that they can even understand the story or the requirement as, as is it given to them. So I'll leave the cone of uncertainty aside for the purpose of this discussion. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. and I'll, uh, I'll talk about the domain familiarity in a slightly different way again in uh, future slides and I call it context, but it is uh, one of the things I, in my experience, uh, have, have I found it to be very useful to articulate the business needs, the product vision, and strategy. And so providing the context, basically. And I'll talk about it more further down. So um, 
so I didn't cover uh, the, uh, the the arrow that uh, that says risk. Uh, so one of the uh, so as uh, you have probably guessed already, uh, when you have a uh, a system uh, a, a team that's not familiar with the domain and your uh, the requirements are at a vision or even an epic level at an epic level uh, if you're running the risk the risk is higher and it needs to be managed uh, much more carefully uh, so this is a useful chart for any uh, any company that is working with a distributed team, not necessarily, they don't have to be remote, uh, like halfway across the world or halfway around the world uh, or, you know, quarter of the way. If, if any distributed team, you have a higher risk. Yeah. So I guess what, what, they, what, a, what a company has to assess on this risk is where they are in these rates. Now, if you're a distributed team, if, you, if your product manager is in Austin, and your development team happens to be in Salt Lake City, you have a certain degree of, of complexity, but your context is at least like a pharmacy system is still understandable. On the other hand, if the product manager is in Austin and the team is in uh, Costa Rica, then you have, of course, a different higher degree of context right. issue, and even higher if the t development team happens to be in Pune, India, like in our case. Right. right? Whole different, the way the uh, pharmacy system is completely different. So depending on what how different your context of a development team is versus the product manager is where context of geographic location and all that you you should map yourself onto this and assess the risk right right, right. and we talk about how we have handled the the, the uh, risk the these situations later okay. so um so one of the things uh, i wanted to do so that we don't forget uh, uh the context again of the previous uh, uh, I want to provide an example of what I mean when I say uh, user stories with acceptance criteria uh, user story with just a description and in an epic level uh, you know a story that is that is pretty much an epic so um, so here's the example um, and th these are all examples that I have worked on so uh, the mobile email client, uh, this is very straightforward and uh, I've taken one just uh, on, uh, on the domain access only. So where, you know, I'm, I'm able to, uh, as a user, when I get notified about an email, I'm able to access it immediately. And I have listed four acceptance criteria. Now these are all, uh, I've uh, I had many more, but um, uh, I picked four just for the sake of brevity. But uh, if you you get the idea that you know the clearer the acceptance criteria is, you're uh, you're better off that the development team will execute that uh, to your satisfaction as a product manager. So the next one is um, an online auction. Uh, and this is uh, again the uh, it's just the domain that's not uh, uh, that may or may not may be may not be familiar to the development team but here again i have uh, we have fairly clear acceptance criteria of what needs to be um, um, what needs to be specified and this is this this applies to an e-commerce site as well so um, Whenever I search for uh, items, and I, I get presented, um, you know what I want to be, what I want as a product manager. Uh, so the better I specify, the you know chances are better that uh, you'll get what you uh, want. And the next one, the pharmacy system example is this is in my mind an epic, or even higher than an epic. Uh, which can be broken down further. Uh, so as a pharmacy technician, I want to be able to update the information for a given medication so that it's specific to the patient. So now um, uh, a team sitting in, uh, in a different uh, geographical location uh, doesn't know and um, will, not, will probably not 
uh, will have to have many, many conversations with the product manager, product owner to understand what's being asked uh, of them. So this is uh, this is an epic level. Uh, um, I don't want to call it a story, an epic where the familiarity is low and details are sparse. So these are the examples that I wanted to um, highlight what I was talking about in that uh, map of domain familiarity available granularity of requirements. So um, to go into the a uh, little bit more about uh, how to make the, your requirements uh, better understood by a development team, a distributed team. Uh, so we already talked about the two main ones, industry uh, familiarity, uh, how detailed are your requirements. And the third one I want to bring up is product vision. It, it, seems, uh, it seems redundant and it seems like it's a given, but uh, sometimes the team uh, teams don't understand what uh, exactly is the vision and where is this product headed. And I'll talk more about it further down, further into my uh, presentation. Um, and collaboration, collaboration between the product management team and the uh, development team, and the transparency both ways uh, of where the product manager is able to articulate what's uh, what they're asking, what they're looking for, and being um, uh, and the development team also being able to uh, reflect back what's being asked. So the collaboration, which of which actually is referred to in the um, in Agile as three C's uh, um, as conversation. Card confirmation and converse, conversation. So this collaboration uh, is basically, I think, falls under the conversation category, and that that's that's a key uh, factor for helping uh, um, the team understand the requirements. And um, something that um, that most people do, uh, it, it also helps to. Uh, uh, present is a user, how the end user uses the product. The user perspective helps as well. Um, and, and the slicing of functionality, whether it's horizontal or vertical, we, um, uh, we as a services company, we always ask our clients to see if it is possible to slice a product vertically um, in terms of functionality, and uh, we understand that it's not always possible. The back end may, be, may not even be ready, but the front end work can start, and it ha often has been the case. But um, if, if, a, if, a, if a product is vertically sliced, it's because of the fact that it's the end-to-end uh, -end feature or the slice of the feature gets uh, completed, it's easier for a development team to see what the product is and what it does, and that that helps understand future requirements better. Are you also saying, Ranjini, that a vertical slice is easier to understand for a for a remote development team yes. than a horizontal slice? Yeah. So, um, and it, I think it, 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 these are all factors mm -hmm. in helping uh, understand, helping the development teams understand what's being has to be built. For the purposes of audience, in case they have not heard the terminology of horizontal and vertical, can you take an example to a requirement which may seem horizontal versus what may seem what may be more vertical? Um, for uh, for instance, in this case, um, the last uh, client that I worked with was an, an RPA tool, robotic process automation. So, um, so the back end, uh, so this was automating a business process, and without going into too many details and just to illustrate what is horizontal, yeah. what is vertical. So, um, being able to uh, automate a business process, let's say that the uh, that an end user, uh, in this case, a healthcare insurance worker, is trying to 
uh, determine how to handle a claim that's been denied. So uh, you, the, the, the back end which is running the actual automation on a different machine, it, that, that is the back end piece and the front end piece is where the uh, insurance uh, claims processor is uh, actually making a change to the business process itself. So the execution, um, so th what our team had to do was mock the back end to, uh, to test that the front end UI when the, uh, when the processing has happened, we had to mock the back end to see wh what the end result would be. But we didn't know how the back end would be built, uh, or what the real back end would be, like which ran the automation mm -hmm. on an actual mm -hmm. claims processing uh, site. Mm -hmm. So, so we were out of step. So it's 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 difficult for a UI developer mm -hmm. to see a, and interact uh, in real time. Mm -hmm. uh, so using mock data is got challenging. So I think if we had uh, sliced it vertically and made sure that we went incrementally vertically mm -hmm. uh, implementing the functionality, yeah. it would okay. have been better. Right. Because in the end, we had to change the UI to cool. the back end. Thanks. So, um, so the next slide is about these are fundamentals of good user stories for any theme, but especially for distributed and remote teams, um, uh, we, we know about uh, the INVEST uh, and mnemonic or uh, acronym, independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small and testable. And again, these all go back to that, uh, if you look at it at, the, at, at Mike Cohn's video of user stories, how to write good user stories, testable goes again back to that vertical slicing so um, but uh, uh, in 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 our world uh, of uh, trying to be a bridge between a, a, a client in the US and a development team in India um, the fundamentals for us are like the context again the business uh, you know the business requirements the product vision strategy, Persona, who's and who's actually using the um, the application, the product? What actions are are expected to happen in in that uh, as part of that user story? What are the outcomes expected? And if we have a mock-up, a drawing, even just a just a just a stick figure of what you know, what the page, and let's say, for example, a web page or a mobile app page looks like. Those are all, uh, you know, good, uh, good, those are all good information to have on a story that a remote team will be more successful at developing. And uh, that, which, you know, encourages further conversation. So, and to drive home the point of the uh, uh, context, and again, you know, that kind of mitigates the challenge of um, uh, domain unfamiliarity. Um, so here I wanted to show you uh, something that I've seen very often in my uh, experience in the last uh, several years. Uh, where a client comes in and, uh, you know, I, uh, we start with the set of, uh, with the product backlog, which is great actually, we are always ask our clients to have a product backlog full of stories and um, what gets lost and then we put it in sprints uh, like, uh, and you know, the backlog is built, there's a sprint and N plus one and, um, and then we even have features and there, uh, map to epics in Jira and um, and you know uh, it, it's all it, the higher you go uh, you get a better picture but uh, often we just have back stories in the backlog and then we put it into sprints and we start executing which is great because in agile we want to start uh, um, start developing a 
product and, uh, and it's something that brings business value, of course. But um, one of the things that often seems to uh, get the teams um, the, uh, the feedback from the development remote team I get is that, you know, you know we are building these, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are going through sprints, building um, a product, but we quite don't get the big picture. So it, it is useful, uh, and uh, I don't know, the, tool, uh, the tools out there are not the greatest at providing this. Um, but if you as a client or, uh, you know, can provide this big picture of the product, if it's, and if it's even a roadmap, of okay, this is what it, this release we are accomplishing, and and you know you can use you know the time I put the time um, arrow there to indicate that if uh, indicate that roadmap right. So if if you can help the team remote team understand uh, where in the product roadmap they are and give them a good vision of uh, the product, I think that's very very useful. So um, and um, and Jeff Patton has very uh, on his website. You can find more details about user story mapping, and I uh, listed that link here. So I think the context I find is very useful, and we on this side, uh, I speak from my experience as a product manager on the U.S. side. It's easy to overlook uh, very easily overlook point is that we are uh, we understand the business context the picture but uh, it, the the team uh, remote team does not uh, sometimes get it so uh, give them a context if possible whenever possible so uh, here is an example um, it all looks the same like the first one, except once I get into features and uh, epics. And I've taken a very, very simple example here. To um, So everyone is familiar with the mobile email client. So you might just, uh, in the first two sprints, uh, do uh, just, you know, a, some subsection of these three uh, uh, these three epics, you do receive messages and um, notifications, and you want to be able to first receive messages, be able to send messages next, and you know be able to support multiple mailboxes. This is, by the way, exactly what we did with the clients that uh, we built uh, an Android and iOS clients uh, for uh, their email server. This was a while back, so it's kind of old. Dated, but but I wanted to show an example of where you would um, where you want to provide the vision and the product roadmap, and it could be just at an epic level, and however you want to break down the uh, your business or product vision into strategy, and uh, basically review this with the team regularly and provide them the context. So, um, so the next thing that I want to cover is um, the, uh, we found in our uh, experience at Synergy that, that the, there, there is a distinction between product owner and product manager. Um, and and uh, often this role, the two roles are played sometimes by the same person, but uh, from uh, our understanding, and we, uh, this is pragmatic marketing uh, definition as well, um, uh, we like to distinguish the two. So there is a, a, a good significant amount of difference uh, where the product owner is focused on the development team. They are managing um, the uh, uh, sprint backlog and product backlog uh, very, very closely. And uh, they're answering the development team's questions real time. So it's a very, very technical, um, 
it's a not a very sorry it's a more technical role and uh, they, they need to be able to understand uh, the, uh, the technical constraints but they are very uh, meshed with the development team uh, very closely and a product manager is a more outward facing um, their role is more outward facing in that they are talking with customers the end users of the product and they need they understand they're understanding what the market needs are so they um, and they are creating uh, you know at least a 12 to 18 months roadmap for the product and you know uh, articulating the strategy and they, of course they have a vision of what they want built but they are definitely market focused and uh, and this this role um, it, it's a challenge if both are if both roles are being played by the same person because then you kind of are uh, split um, with your time and it's uh, it's a challenge so um, ideally a product manager and a product owner operating in close alignment is one of the it, it's the way to ensure that you're building a product um, that the market wants and, and that would end up being successful so and you can get into more details at the link that I uh, that's provided here um, so in the next uh, slide uh, uh, Hemant, do you want to cover yeah yeah this? so I can cover this one just amplifying what Ranjini just covered the role of product manager and product owner so what this slide depicts is you see the graphic on the left left is a typical kind of a distributed team configuration where for example what we're calling a client team let's say is a ace full scrum team in Austin uh, time zone Texas and uh, so let's say uh, the right you have another full scrum team in the in India with synergy let's say in that time zone and you see a product manager bubble in the middle and the idea they're trying to illustrate with this graphic is that product manager could be a part of the client in this case examples team and be joined at the hip still with the product owner on the India side or the product manager could also be on the India side in that time zone but still join at the hip with the product owner also on the in the in the full scrum team in the in in the Austin time zone in this example but the idea is usually product managers located closer to the market as Ranjini said in the previous page where the customer geography is their, their customers and the product owner is usually located closer to the scrum team usually part of the scrum team by core part of that and uh, sometimes we have this notion that we uh, you heard uh, called proxy product owner so what that is is you may have a product manager and product owner both in one geography uh, let's say in the in the US time zone but on the India time zone in our case the, there is one of the developers in the team who's senior and and has the context enough context will function as a proxy product owner and those are all uh, very acceptable variations and of course the rest of the development environment as you see here is pretty straight straightforward these days the, the dev environment is pretty much local for each developer in their on their machines and local and rest everything else is on the cloud and if you need you can set up a VPN to allow collaboration and all that so that's become pretty straightforward but the idea is uh, we just want to clarify the product manager versus product owner versus proxy product owner type roles as you will uh, see in the next pages how they come together yeah. so um, in this slide I wanted to cover a little bit about uh, what we do in our uh, process uh, we try to assess where the clients are uh, do we have epic level uh, description we have do we have clear user stories with the acceptance criteria this does not mean that every detail is covered, but you know, basic acceptance criteria. Um, we, uh, and I, and uh, to go back to that, uh, the, 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 the three C's, uh, one big thing is a conversation, which is the thing, which is, the, which is what remote teams have to struggle with because of limited uh, overlap of uh, available time. So, you still you have a card and you have uh, all these are meant to 
uh, further conversation, but it helps to have more details. So we figure, uh, we assess where the clients are, and then we uh, d determine if uh, the level of product owner involvement and how often do we need to have that feedback loop. And what we also discover is that early on in the site, in the engagement, there's the, the feedback needs to be very frequent in terms of conversations. Not, I'm not talking about demos and uh, reviews and retrospectives, but just you know, product own, manager, product owner involvement from a, a, a U.S. client side. And um, and uh, one factor in the process is also domain specific uh, assumptions that we have run into. For example. For a pharmacy system, we have we have to handle uh, personal health information, PHI data, which uh, and uh, the development team needs to be HIPAA certified. So uh, some of the things, uh, and th this is just an example, but we have restrictions. Uh, we have to factor in what constraints we are working under, and um, and uh, in our process, we. We, we try to make sure, again, back to the first slide of both the client and the development team should have a, uh, should be on the same page in terms of expectations. And that's that's one thing that we have uh, we try to uh, you know uh, navigate towards so that you know no one is surprised that uh, you know oh, you, you, that anything uh, that there is any miscommunication limit. Uh, so we start with daily conversations between the product managers, slash product owner, and the development team uh, at the beginning of an engagement, and then it flows, I mean, it tapers down, but there is always conversation through either uh, calls or, you know, a medium like Slack, but uh, it, it's just more intense, uh, it, it's more intense in the beginning. So, um, in, uh, so the next slide here, uh, the uh, for this is primarily from a citizen perspective, and please use it for your situation as it applies. Um, so what uh, what we do look for is what is the client product product management team able to provide to us. So as we said, it's if it's um, it's if it's if it's the the stories are. Well defined, with uh, well de uh, well described, clear acceptance criteria, and um, then we uh, and the then we the our team, so there's a remote team, is we can the development team with a team lead who's uh, who's a senior person can handle it, and. Um, and if it is just epics and stories with, with, uh, where the acceptance criteria still need to be fleshed out and the uh, client is only has a product manager um, giving the uh, uh, writing stories, then we, uh, we found what works effectively is a product owner. It could be somebody uh, like a, a senior QA who's, or a senior developer who's playing that role in addition, and uh, in addition to doing their regular QA or development work, but we do need a a P product owner who's embedded in that uh, remote team to, uh, to flesh out the acceptance criteria and more details about the story. And um, and we uh, and the third one where the product only the vision is available, and we often ha have this scenario happened to us um, where only the vision is available um, and then we recommend that uh, there is a product manager and a product owner uh, and the product manager in this scenario as we saw before uh, in the in the definition is actually doing some of the customer like market facing work of gathering data uh, of what what the fit you know if doing market research, etc. So, um, so this is what we've found in our uh, evaluation of clients that this this works. So, um, so, uh, so coming back to this chart of um, 
in a visual form, what I covered earlier uh, is to put it all together, starting from our first, where we, uh, if you have a domain, if you have a theme that is very familiar with the, uh, a theme familiar with the domain, and the client theme, uh, or you know, the, the business in the U.S. is able to provide detailed uh, uh, user stories. We, uh, you know, we have this in in this range where there is green. A developer plus QA team works. As soon and then when you go further towards a scenario where domain is somewhat familiar, but details are few. You um, do uh, you know the dev plus QA plus product owner at uh, on the remote side is uh, is the pro is the you know is a combination that uh, seems to work the best. And then um, when we are in the red zone, um, then you know we definitely need to be uh, able to provide uh, the what we at centers the uh, provide is not only development, product owner, it's product manager also. So um, this is this is what we um, recommend. Then that one that's worked for our clients. Yeah, so that manages the risk that we showed in the uh, you showed in the earlier part version of this chart. That if you don't have in the top right corner red uh, that. That in this example, the Synerzip team would need to account for having a product manager and a product owner to account for the fact that available requirements are low granularity and it is unfamiliar domain for dev team. Right. right. Okay. right. So, yeah. so for so this is the prescription that we uh, we ourselves follow for um, the for our engagements. So we uh, assess where the client client team is on the map so and then based on that we uh, determine what product management support that uh, we can provide so I, I recommend that uh, you know if you use this um, these are the two big factors uh, and hopefully uh, this is something that that you can help evaluate um, uh, where your engagements are, projects are, and you know, act accordingly. So um, I will. I want to go into some examples. Yes, I'll tell you what. In the interest of time, let's take a bit of a pause, and we'll come back to examples if the time allows, Ranjini. Uh, let's take a few questions, um, and uh, that we have from the audience, and I have maintained these questions in the backlog right now, and let's ask also prompt people to put in any other questions they may have as you guys heard this uh, uh, perspective of managing requirements. If you have any other questions that you haven't already put in, uh, why don't you go ahead and ask. While you do that, I'm going to jump a few slides forward and do a quick intro to Synerzip, then take a few questions, and then we'll come back if time permits cover more examples. So uh, while you guys are reflecting on this material, let me just take for those of you who joined us today and have no familiarity with Synergip, let me just take a couple minutes to introduce us. Um, so we are a software development services company based here in Texas uh, with, uh, with our professionals in Silicon Valley and New York City and a development team in India. So we struggle with this challenge of a development team in India. So we are essentially, we function as a trusted co-development partner for our clients across the entire product life cycle from early stage MVP development to a mature uh, maintenance stage products and all that. And uh, the four things we bring to the table for our clients, uh, most of our clients tend to be long term, are we are either helping them accelerate their technology roadmap by providing them a skill team and or we are addressing any of the technology skill gaps may, they may have in their in-house team. They may not have say DevOps skills or they may not have AI or machine learning skills and all that. So we help address some of those gaps. And then while we're doing that, we are also able to provide a significant economics advantage with a team based in India. So typically 50% of better cost advantage. And in some cases where a client's values, we have, like I mentioned in Silicon Valley and Texas and New York, we have our US based teams to facilitate working with the India based team for our clients. So that's kind of in a nutshell. 
um, and next page, Ranjan, if you forward just uh, just a quick glimpse of some of our clients uh, to give you an indication. Almost all our clients, the main, main thing to I guess note here for our work and our focus is most of our clients are software companies. So we work with software companies, helping them accelerate their technology roadmap. So with that, let's come back to take some questions. Um, uh, so one question I think if we can bring back uh, that, uh, maybe just bring back the synergy page and leave it at that and we'll take questions. Um, uh, maybe this page is fine too. <laughs> so uh, one question here someone asked was in this green section when we say dev plus QA only is it best to have dev QA plus PM plus PO in the green? So the answer is I think this page seems to mislead people. The green doesn't mean that you don't have a product manager and a product owner. Okay. We're just saying in this green section for the, for the distributed remote development team in that part of the team you you can get away with only a dev and QA. Of right. course, on the client face side, you would have a product owner and a product manager. So that's not the intent. The other question that we should take uh, is how does this vary this for domain familiarity across time? When you're starting new with a team versus uh, a team that has been working with the same product management or same business requirements team over time, does it change? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, you know when a th team is new to the do do domain, the initial part of the first part of the engagement, it's it's uh, they're building uh, knowledge. So um, so they uh, as they as time time goes forward, you they're they've built up uh, they're becoming more and more familiar. So initially, it's uh, it, there is you know there you. The, they need a lot more support from the client team in terms of building, uh, uh, building uh, familiarity and knowledge. So the um, as time goes on, as, as they become familiar, the you don't need to provide the granularity of requirements as you did early on in the engagement. Good. All right. And the other question was we showed in the earlier version of this page uh, on the left granularity side, acceptance test-driven development, ATDD. Can you amplify that for audience a bit? What is ATDD? And if yep. that is so good, why don't we use it more? Yeah, so ATDD is acceptance test-driven development, okay. which means that you start, uh, many of you might have heard test-driven development, but this is acceptance test-driven development, which is uh, basically how the end user is using so it's more a functional uh, description of the product usage so um, the uh, it, it, so what happens in that scenario is that the product manager and the product owner have very clear detailed description of the what the product is doing or a part of the product is doing so if we can start uh, just like TDD, if you can start coding for the ATDD, uh, you, uh, you're basically automating it at that point. You're going to, um, uh, you're obviously going to end up with a product that is exactly what the product manager or product owner wanted. But the reason it doesn't happen uh, as, uh, it, it's great, but it, no, as most product managers and product owners on uh, on this webinar probably are thinking that no one has uh, they have very little time to write that level of detailed requirements to the point of uh, where a development team can actually take the acceptance test and start developing from that. Okay, so well, that's a good segue that, yeah. into your examples if. If we, since we have a few more minutes, can you go through your example that we skipped over and we illustrate as you go along this topic of acceptance test and acceptance criteria, if you can, through right. these examples also. So here I, I wanted to I, uh, wanted to cover the low familiar, familiarity um, uh, domain of a pharmacy system. So here the epic description is the, uh, uh, I want uh, to edit a patient-related information. Uh, and the story, if you look at it, uh, is as the pharmacy tech, I want the ability to customize prescription drug information for a patient so that it is relevant to them. So in this case, uh, if you look at it, the developers and QA uh, need 
a good amount of time with the product owner, product manager to understand what what are you asking for? What what do you mean by the what do you mean customize? What does it look like to begin with? And you know uh, they've been given the vision is to uh, build the UI for a and the back end for a retail pharmacy. So that's that's the vision that they've come in with. And there's the epics is reads as edit patient related information. And the story is this. so the the development team is unfamiliar with the domain. They, you know, they uh, they're just starting out. So, um, so then we have acceptance uh, criteria, which gives you more details, right? So, um, and this is why the conversation is important. Um, and at this point, the the product owner has or product manager has uh, provided a basic UI design, saying that. Okay, this is what my screen is going to look like, um, and in this case, we have a story, um, and the acceptance criteria says I should be prompted to fill in mandatory information such as dosage and timings for the dosage um, for that prescription drug, and then I I also should be able to put in some optional information such as uh, in my mind I'm imagining you know any uh, contraindications. So, um, so this this gives you this gives the team a little more uh, information, and but you know again, I, I, the, this is you know uh, more conversations needed, and and then um, so for a uh, so he, going into another level now. I can I can prov I'm providing uh, more information at this point as a product owner or manager. So in our grade, you're moving closer to the left in the safer zone. Correct. In this case, now by so giving are, more and more granularity. Correct. So unfamiliar domain. So at least we are coming to the yellow portion. Uh, okay. You're going to the yellow portion here. You're not, you're not in green yet. Not, not even, even green. with this acceptance criteria. Well. Uh, we are getting closer to. I'm talking about un low familiarity at this right. point. So, if if okay. a month down the road they would be green, I think. Okay. Good. So why don't you go through this example? Yeah. Yeah. So here, as you say, uh, that um, you know, most likely the developer or QA can take this. I am prompted to fill in mandatory information uh, uh, such as dosage and timing. Detail two is limit. I mean, this is more technical details uh, of you know what what's allowed and not. And I forgot to put the uh, mandatory uh, you know optional information. And I say, okay, just save all the text as it's being typed so that it's easier to um, uh, so that less action is required on the tech pharmacy technicians part. But if you uh, the most important thing is that the refined UI, the user interface is available. As I mentioned uh, early on in the presentation that uh, a picture, and we all know the same saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, so refined UI is available. That's a key part of a story uh, when, uh, when you're able to provide, uh, provide a UI, uh, a wireframe that provides the details. Your acceptance criteria, you don't have to be uh, you know, so specific, so uh, as to you know, type everything out. So, in the interest of time, we don't think we can go through your other examples, but we can take one relevant question to this page, if you can, which is you brought up this issue of UI design. What's the difference in the role of a UI designer versus a product manager slash product owner? Who does the UI design? You seem to be implying that product manager is providing UI design, right? Yeah, in most uh, many cases, uh, and it's changing now as, uh, as time goes by. Uh, when I started, it seems like the product manager is providing the UI design. Uh, they they at least provide the wireframes to begin with, um, and that's that was uh, that's how it was earlier. But now more and more, uh, the product manager is working very closely with the UX slash UI designer. To um, to it, to come up with the design. In fact, it, the, the UI designer might start the, the design first. But the, uh, I wanted to 
make the point that the product manager is ultimately responsible, accountable for the design of the product. Right. Yeah. Super. Well, thank you, Ranjini. I think we ran out of time, so this has been very helpful. Hopefully, helpful for all the audience to give some guidance on how to manage distributed teams and still build the right product. Right. So happy okay. holidays to all of you. We'll reconvene for another webinar next month in 2019. Thanks, Ranjini. Thanks, Jill.